Are you writing a research paper, but you're not really sure how to write it, how to structure it, where to start, what to put in each section? Or maybe you haven't started yet, but you want to write a research paper, but you're worried about those same things and you can't get even get started because you don't know what you need to do. That's why in this video, I'm going to show you an example of a research paper and I will tell you exactly how it's structured and what to put in each section. And this is going to work regardless of the field that you're in. Why do I say regardless of the field that you're in? Because really a lot of people have this big, big misconception that, you know, research papers differ so much in different fields. Granted, they differ a little bit, but it's a little bit like with the iceberg where you know, just the top 10% of the iceberg is above water and everybody sees it and focuses on it, whereas 80% or 90% is below water. It's the same with a research paper. People focus on those visible differences, but they're really like 10, 15% of the whole research paper. Everything else is the same. So that's why in this video, I'm gonna show you how to structure the paper, how to write it on a clear example of a published research paper. But before we do that, if you're new here, my name is Marek Kiczkovek and I run Academic English Now, where I help PhD students and researchers regularly publish research papers in top journals in the field. And if you'd like to work with me more personally, then schedule a free one-to-one -one consultation where we're going to go over the challenges that you have and the goals and outline a personalized strategy to see how we can help you publish more papers. So with that said, let's take a look at an example of a research paper and how it should be written. This example paper that I want to show you is from the field of medicine, psychology, and it was actually written by um, one of my clients on my program, PhD Accelerator, Anke Borner. Um, so I want to show you, you know, how she did it and how you can structure research papers and write them. And don't worry if you're in a completely different field because, you know, really the, I will show you the underlying principles that are followed, you know, almost regardless of the field. Then you can adjust them slightly to the specific differences of a specific journal or field. But don't worry about that now. Try to kind of understand the overall flow because this will be very, very helpful, right? So I'll skip the abstract for now and get straight into the introduction. How does the introduction work? Well, first of all, we want to talk about the importance of the topic and then you want to define the topic. So in this case, we say straight away that teamwork is important and there is a definition of teamwork. And then, you know, the researcher continues with that importance of the topic. Now, the second element in an introduction is a literature review. Make it brief, a couple of paragraphs, maybe two, three, maximum four paragraphs. In other fields, it might just even be one paragraph. And remember that you're doing the literature review because you're going towards the research gap and your main point, which is your research aim. So this is exactly what, um, what she does, what Anke does. And then in here, you know, we've got the research gap, right? Uh, that there is a, um, a lack of knowledge or uncertainty, right? There's a lack of studies, only one study on a specific topic, right? And then, you know, she further highlights why examining this specific thing is important. And then we've got the aim of the study, right? And this is followed by specifically what was done and also the hypothesis. What is sometimes done in the introductions as well is to tell the reader um, what the contribution of the paper is and then present the organization of the paper. This wasn't done here, but sometimes it's also done. Then we've got the methods section. So in some fields, it will be called materials and methods, in other fields, methodology, but it's one and the same thing. And basically the elements are the same, whether you're studying human subjects or, you know, non-human subjects. In her case, in Anka's case, it's a human subject. So the first section of the materials and methods, it's what or who you study. And you want to give us background information about these people or these things. So in her case, you know, she talks about the number of people that took part 
um, in the study, you know, how these people were recruited and so on. Now, if you were to study non-human subjects, like let's say, I don't know, enzymes, for example, or some, some sort of bacteria or things like that, right? Then you still want to talk about the, the number or the quantity of the thing that you studied and how you obtained this thing that you actually studied. How did you get it, right? And this is the first section. Then you want to talk about she calls it instruments, right? It can be also called research tools or sometimes it can be called um, methods, simply. But the point of this section is to present us the things that you used in order to study your subject or your bacteria or your enzymes or whatever you were studying, right? In her case, it was a questionnaire. Maybe you used an interview or maybe, you know, you used a particular microscope technology to study your bacteria. Whatever it was, you need to present the instrument or the tool that you used and the procedures that you used. For example, you know, the questionnaire was distributed, right? Then you want to talk about this tool. How is this tool structured? How it is used? And so on, right? And then the next section is data analysis. So in this section, you're basically going to tell us how you analyze the data. Whether you conducted qualitative or quantitative data analysis, this doesn't matter. You still have to explain how your data was analyzed, which statistical tests did you use and why were those tests appropriate? Why did you choose these tests and these data analysis techniques and not others. Same goes for qualitative data analysis. Why did you uh, use you know, content analysis and not thematic analysis or something else, right? And explain step by step how the data was analyzed. As you can see you know, in here, um, there, is, there are two paragraphs, so there's not that much detail and this depends on the field that you're in and how complex your data analysis techniques was. You might find that you need a whole page to explain, you know, especially I found in fields like economics, there's all sorts of like tests that people do and equations and stuff like this. And sometimes it's like two pages of the different data analysis techniques, right? And then we present the results. Super simple. How do we present the results? Typically, the most logical way to do this is to divide it by the main topics or if you had more than one research question by research question, right? And very often what happens, as you can see here, is if you were um, doing a study on human subjects, you might present some descriptive information about those subjects first, as you can see here with the different percentages about the people that took part in the study. And of course, as you're presenting quantitative data, you're going to be using tables like this. If you're presenting qualitative data, you're going to be using quotes from participants. And I've got another video in which I show how to present qualitative data appropriately, so you might want to check that one out. And then, you know, what, what we want to do is present the main results and briefly point out the key things. So a big mistake that people make is that they feel like they need to present all the numbers. You don't. You should only present the most important things, right? Not everything. The reader can see everything here. What, what we need to do is the, to present the most important information. And what you must also do is to refer to the table. So a big mistake I see people do is that they kind of insert a table or a figure, but never refer to it in a text. That's a big mistake. So you must refer to the, to the table or a figure. And think how to organize that information most logically. Typically, the best way to do this is by topics and subtopics. So that's the results. And then what you want to do is discuss the results. What do we do in a discussion section? First, we present, again, maybe overall, how do we organize it? Well, typically we organize it in the same way as the results section. So if you had like three subsections in the results, you want to have three subsections in the discussion that correspond to exactly those same things, right? Um, and the first thing that, that you do in kind of each paragraph is to restate your main result, right? Um, as you can see here, you know, there is the first finding, right? And then typically what is 
um, what is done is a comparison with the literature, right? Um, and then here we've got Valkiewicz found that medical blah, blah, blah. And so we compare our results with the literature. And then what happens if there is a difference, like in, in this case, we want to explain this difference, right? It's possibly due to, right? And we want to we wanna explain that difference. Now, also what you want to talk about is give a little bit of an explanation. So again, state the result, compare it with literature, and then tell us, you know, what these results actually mean. So a big mistake that I see people make is that they just kind of talk about the results over and over again. But there is little interpretation, explanation of the results. So that's a big mistake, right? And then you can see how nicely this is divided into topics. We've got team roles and gender, team roles and future specialties, right? What did we have here before? Medical students as team workers. So it's kind of divided into the same sections as the results was, and you know it's very easy to follow because of the subheadings. Now, in here, there's an interesting thing. So Anke included practical implications in the discussion section. You might find that this is sometimes placed in the conclusion section. And I'm gonna show you another example where this was placed in the conclusion. But what, what do we do here in the practical implications? You basically wanna take your main results and think how they can benefit practitioners, how can they impact you know, what people actually do um, in practice. So in here, of course, she talks about medical education. So what is the impact for people who educate uh, future doctors, you know? But what is the impact for, you know, medical students themselves? What medical students can get out of it? What, what are the practical implications for universities, right? And educational policy. So you want to think about these different stakeholders and how your findings might impact them in practice right? So that's practical implications. And then we've got the limitations, strengths and limitations of your study in this case. But it's important to, you know, to look at um, the limitations and how this is actually um, done, right? So you basically need to acknowledge the limitation, right? Our study had a cross-sectional design, which might be prone to cohort effects. That's a clear limitation. But then what you want to do is maybe defend your approach a little bit. So you want to say, nonetheless, our results have remained consistent, right? So we say, yeah, sure, this study is limited. However, despite this, we're still making a nice contribution to the field, right? So you want to end on a more um, positive note, right? And then what you also want to do to end on a positive note is maybe present suggestions for future research, right? So there's a limitation and then this is connected to suggestions for future research. Now note that again, uh, limitations and suggestions for future research are also often placed in the conclusion. I'm gonna show you an example in just a second. And then we've got a conclusion in here, which is basically just one paragraph, it's very short. What is done in the conclusion is like um, restatement of the importance of the topic, um, the aim of the study, the main results of the study, right? And the implications of those results, like the main takeaway message of the study, right? So this is an example of a paper from psychology medicine, right? And I wanted to show you, you know, I pointed out some clear kind of differences, let's say. So I wanted to show you a paper from a different field, which is in fact a paper that I wrote myself a couple of years ago. And, and see how things work differently. So the first main difference that I wanna point out to you is the introduction. That you will notice that the introduction here is much, much shorter. In my case, it's just three paragraphs. It still follows the same pattern that I discussed with the other paper, so I'm not gonna go over it again, right? And then we've got a literature review. So notice that you know in the paper that we were discussing in Anke's uh, paper, the literature review was just part of the introduction, right? And it was a couple of paragraphs. There was no additional literature review section. However, and this is very common in sort of social sciences, more socially oriented sciences, that there is a separate literature review section. And that, that's what you have here. And in this section, we just identify the main 
themes from the literature, right? And present them and present what has been done thus far on this theme. So you can see that, you know, the main theme, even if you don't know what it means, is native speakerism and then native speakers. And then, you know, the specific sub themes like ideal language models and teachers, right? Um, preferences of students, right? Um, recruitment or in English language teaching, right? So we take this main topic of our paper and just divide it into subtopics and that's how we do the, the literature review, right? And then of course we've got research questions in here. So the main difference with Amkes is that she just had one sentence which was a research aim. In here we have specific research questions, right? The methods are the same, so I'm not going to go over it. The structure is exactly the same as what you saw with Anka, but I want to show you the results section because in here, apart from quantitative data, I also have qualitative data. So as I mentioned, there's another video on this channel where I discuss how to present qualitative data and also how to format qualitative data, but I just wanted to show you here as well that you, know, you want to format it slightly differently from the main text, right? And you can see as well how I combine it with quantitative data. So there's quantitative data and then there's qualitative data. Another important thing that I wanted to point out to you is how I did the discussion here. So you might remember that in Anke's paper in here, she had a results section, which was just a presentation of the facts of the results and nothing else. And then there was a discussion section in which she compared her results to previous studies. Now, in this study, the discussion and results are together. So I present a result and then I compare it with the literature. And then whenever appropriate, you know, I also discuss this result and explain it, tell people what this result actually means. So this is slightly different and both ways are fine. There is no better or worse way. It just kind of depends on the field that you're in, on the conventions of a particular journal, right? So again, you can see I present results and then I discuss those results, right? Now, the, another big difference that I wanted to point out to you is in the conclusion section. So when we were discussing Anka's paper, you could see that her conclusion was very short. It was just one paragraph, but she included some elements like, for example, um, implications for practice, limitations in the discussion section. Instead, this conclusion is much longer and it includes additional elements, right? So in here, you know, the first paragraph just kind of summarizes the main topic. It summarizes the main result, a brief discussion of that result and what that result means, right? And then, you know, what I, what I want to do is highlight the main contribution of this paper, right? Um, in here. And now in here, I present practical implications, right? So rather than have a separate section on it, I have one paragraph, right? And it's just clearly stated in the first sentence of the paragraph so that the reader can very easily identify it. And then we've got the limitation, right? And similarly, um, you know, as, as I was pointing out to you in Anka's paper, what you wanna do is end on a positive uh, note, right? So you can make a suggestion for future research. So don't just end with the limitation, but end with something more positive and state, for example, what other researchers should do, right? So that's another example, but as you can see, despite these small differences, the overall structure is still the same. So now, after seeing this, your task is to apply it to your paper and start writing. Don't postpone writing until tomorrow, next week. It's not gonna get any easier tomorrow or next week. Get started right now, even if you can just write one paragraph. And if you want more help, more personalized advice, feedback on your writing, you wanna work with me personally, then schedule a free one-to-one -one consultation with my team, and the link to do that is right below this video.